Hello class and welcome to the fourth video in my AI uh, series of lectures. Um, in this video I will be talking about AI ethics and algorithmic injustice. Into it. So I want to start with this paper from Peter Saro in 2006. 2006 is before the recent boom in AI and during this period there was a lot of discussion about computer ethics, AI ethics, uh, robot ethics, um, but the discussion was uh, fairly unfocused, maybe a little um, enamored with science fiction scenarios about uh, near-human robotics and how would we tell the difference between a robot that deserves ethics and not. Um, but Peter Saro tries to sort of ground this discussion in uh, more realistic issues. Uh, so he, he distinguishes in this paper between three distinct questions. Uh, the first one is how can humans act ethically through uh, robots or act unethically through robots? Um, here in this first question, the emphasis is on the human as the ethical agent. Uh, and the robot is a sort of instrument through which humans act, um, or medium through which humans act. Um, so uh, in the sense that humans are the primary ethical agents here, the sort of standard ethical analysis um, that you get from, say, an engineering ethics class might, might apply. Um, but uh, this isn't all that we mean by robot ethics. So uh, the second question Peter Sarra raises is, uh, how can humans design robots that, ad, that act ethically or unethically themselves? So in this case, uh, the focus is on um, robots as ethical agents and what they do. Um, but still, the question is uh, puts the focus on the human's uh, ethical role in the design of the robots. So, so the robot is doing something. Um, maybe that thing that the robot's doing is ethical or unethical. Um, but then there's also this further ethical question of how the humans are designing robots to do those things. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, the third question is, uh, how can we understand the relationship between humans and robots? So uh, the, the way that humans treat robots, uh, maybe the ro way that robots treat humans, um, the sort of social and uh, political nature of the interaction between humans and robots. Um, in, in this case, we're not, we're not just looking at humans or robots as ethical agents, but we're looking, in some sense, at the community of uh, humans and robots uh, as, a, as a shared ethical community. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, some of these questions are more um, realistic or pressing than others, uh, but um, uh, Peter Saro mentions all three of these as uh, the kinds of things that people think about when they think about robot ethics. And I want to, use, sort of using this framework, uh, divide these out into sort of two groups. Um, so the top two questions uh, I, I want to uh, identify as being the questions that are sort of central to AI ethics, but both how are humans acting ethically through the robots and um, what is it the robots are doing that the humans are designing. So I, I want to say these first two questions are uh, maybe the central questions in the field of AI ethics. Um, and uh, I want to uh, sort of isolate the third question or maybe group the third and the second question um, in the discussion of robot rights. So uh, here we're taking seriously the robot as an agent and we're thinking about how the robot fits into a, an ethical community. Um, so th this is, I think, the central question of robot rights. Um, and uh, I, I, um, I do want to record eventually a robot rights lecture uh, explicitly. Um, I have other material um, on, on robot rights. Um, and I want to say that the robot rights discussion does have some overlap with the traditional AI ethics discussion. Uh, in particular, it's over this view of robots as agents and sort of what are the robots doing. Um, so I think that that's an issue for both AI ethics and robot rights. Um, but, but I also want to say this is controversial. So there's a lot of people in the AI ethics community who think that the robot rights discussion is uh, really silly and um, uh, sort of unnecessary and m maybe uh, part of this futuristic science fiction hype um, that surrounds the discussion of AI. And so a lot of people in AI ethics want to exclude the whole discussion of robot rights. And in fact, even to exclude the very idea of the robot as an ethical agent. Um, and uh, a lot of people in AI ethics want to say that um, AI ethics is really just about how humans act. It's really just a, a human ethical uh, uh, question, um, how humans act. Um, and to, to push both the second and the third question off uh, into some sort of speculative philosophy. Um, I, I'm not on that extreme end of AI ethics, and maybe I'll talk a little, little bit more about this in the robot rights lectures. Um, but uh, uh, in this lecture, I want to focus on humans acting ethically through robots. Um, I'll touch a little bit on what the robots themselves are doing, but really uh, just to reflect on what this says about the design, um, use, and regulation of AI. So uh, uh, with this sort of framework, when I'm talking about AI ethics, I, I just, in very general terms, mean the ethics of the development and uh, use of AI and robotics. So um, some of this 
uh, is sort of standard from other engineering ethics conversations. I teach an engineering ethics class here at NGIT, um, and we talk about uh, the code of ethics that uh, uh, binds engineering uh, practices and standards and norms. Um, and I think uh, questions about the ethics of AI, both in the use, the misuse, and the development of AI in specific uh, contexts, um, to some extent fits very nicely in with the larger discussion of engineering ethics. Uh, for instance, the fundamental canon of the Code of uh, Ethics for the NSPE, which is the National Society of Professional Engineers, um, their fundamental canon, the very first principle on their Code of Ethics, says that uh, they will hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Um, this is a primary concern for engineering ethics, um, especially if you're building things like bridges and or uh, buildings that might collapse and kill a lot of people. Um, safety uh, and health is, is an important feature that, that people think about um, when they think about engineering ethics. Uh, it's uh, somewhat less likely that um, AI is going to cause uh, buildings to collapse or um, bridges to collapse. Um, the kinds of risks posed by AI aren't exactly the same as other um, kinds of engineering uh, ethics and norms. Uh, so um, uh, some of this needs to be modified to suit the kinds of risks that AI um, exposes people to. Um, these are especially things like uh, security risks, privacy risks. Um, we'll talk more about uh, facial recognition along these lines. Um, things like uh, consent. Um, uh, people usually don't consent to the structure of a bridge. Uh, they also uh, uh, they might consent to some extent uh, with uh, software applications that they use when they click the terms of service, for instance. But uh, the the legal uh, strength of those uh, terms of service policies are, are, are not very clear. Right, so there's a lot of issues in software and uh, sort of computer science about uh, consent issues, access issues, who can access these technologies, who can use these technologies. Um, and there's sort of a big background of human rights and justice that informs a lot of these ethical considerations. Um, so to some extent, uh, uh, this stuff fits into the general discussion of engineering ethics. Um, but there are some specific things about AI and, uh, that uh, make the field of AI ethics unique, and especially sort of the way that AI ethicists talk about these issues. Um, and uh, so not just about the use of AI, um, but also about the, the training of AI and how machine learning algorithms are um, uh, uh, designed and, uh, and how they learn from massive data sets. Um, and uh, there's a lot of interest in the, the process by which they learn, making sure that learning is fair, making sure the, the data that they're training from is fair. Um, a lot of this gets talked about in AI ethics under the, the um, terminology of fairness, um, sometimes uh, in terms of value alignment, which is just that we want to make sure that the machines um, are doing things in the way that we expect or the way that uh, uh, human uh, values work. Um, so I'll give some examples of this uh, in, in this lecture. Um, and then the third question I have up here is about the legal and regulatory environment. So uh, one is about the, the use and misuse of the technology itself. Uh, two is about the training and development of the, those algorithms. And the third one is about the legal and regulatory environment that constrains the use and uh, uh, applications of these, uh, uh, of these technologies. Um, so what uh, legal restrictions or policies or regulatory frameworks, um, what laws in the books uh, protect users, protect the public, um, protect uh, us from abuses or sort of malicious intentions, um, uh, other sorts of failures, security failures, um, with, with tech, um, right? so what, what are the accountability procedures? Um, how do we make sure that everything's being handled fairly um, at an institutional level? These are some sort of general questions um, with, uh, within AI ethics, and I sort of want to look at each one of these questions in, in more detail. So, so first, just about the use and misuse of AI, um, and, and these, I think, correspond to questions that we might ask about engineering projects generally, which is who designs those projects? Um, uh, whose, interests is, whose interests are considered in the design process and whose interests are excluded or ignored. Um, uh, in engineering ethics, this might be things like, uh, for, for instance, in uh, seatbelt design, um, it's important that you're testing lots of different body types um, being protected by those seatbelts. If you're only testing um, the uh, statistically average uh, male body size, um, then that might not be very protective or safe for women or children or people who just don't fit that, uh, that standard template. Right. And the same sorts of issues apply in AI, and I have some examples that I'll show in just a second. Um, so, so we might ask about who designs the AI, but also how is the AI used, who benefits from its use, who's impacted by its use, um, um, how are those users and that impact represented in the design and the uh, development of the AI. And along these lines, it's important to consider that most AI development nowadays is being conducted by major tech firms, usually in collaboration with uh, large research institutions. 
Uh, so um, this uh, chart you see on the screen is the accepted, accepted papers to NeurIPS, which is one of the major uh, AI conferences. It's a neural information processing systems. Um, and NeurIPS uh, takes a lot of papers. It's one of these mega conferences with thousands of papers, um, but a huge number of them are coming from just a few major institutions like uh, Google, Google DeepMind, um, uh, MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Microsoft, Berkeley, Princeton, Facebook. Um, these are the major contributors to the AI research, and this is a very elite crowd. Um, uh, not only is it an elite crowd, but it also has access to a lot of r potentially sensitive data. Um, Google has all your email, Facebook has all your social media. Um, this kind of stuff uh, can be uh, sensitive data that these big tech firms have access to. Um, it makes them uh, uh, able to do really interesting AI work, but it also restricts the people who are impacting and influencing these, um, uh, these technologies. This is just something to keep in mind. Um, I, I linked to uh, some analysis of the papers here, and they've been doing this kind of analysis every year at the major AI conferences, uh, NeurIPS and AAAI. Um, so some more just uh, applications of AI that are worth thinking about, um, especially uh, AI as applied to security or policing, or sometimes what's sometimes called predictive policing. Um, uh, which sounds like something out of Minority Report. Um, this is usually when police are using AI technologies to predict where uh, uh, terrorist events might occur or to predict uh, who is at risk for certain kinds of uh, uh, behaviors or um, diseases. Uh, uh, pr predictive uh, um, in uh, epidemiology, for instance. Um, okay, so uh, 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 some of the technologies used here are things like facial recognition technology and surveillance technologies generally. Um, in fact, this stuff has been very lucrative. Uh, um, uh, Shana uh, Zuboff has a book uh, called Surveillance Capitalism where she talks about um, uh, all, all of these AI technologies uh, and uh, how they're being uh, marketed and sold uh, to, for great profit to, um, to uh, various institutions. Uh, government, government institutions, poli policing institutions, and so on. Um, this stuff isn't just uh, with police, it's also with uh, military applications. Uh, Google and IBM and Amazon have all contributed to uh, not just policing uh, applications, policing software, uh, software used by police uh, to uh, m monitor people, but also uh, software used by the military, um, in military drones, for instance, in order to identify potential terrorist targets, and so on. This is a, a so-called Project Maven that Google helped operate um, with the Department of Defense. Um, um, in the military context, there's a lot of conversation about meaningful human control um, and how, uh, how important it is that uh, especially lethal decisions in a military context are made um, by humans and not by the machine. Um, so, so this meaningful human control is supposed to be in contrast to something like humans in the loop. Uh, humans in the loop is just that there's a human monitoring the, what the AI is doing, uh, maybe checking in on the AI every once in a while. Um, and it's important for a lot of the AI ethicists in the military, uh, uh, talking about these military applications, that it's not just humans in the loop, but it's also uh, that the human has meaningful control over uh, critical uh, decisions like kill decisions. Right. So uh, it's not the AI pressing the kill button, it's... Uh, it's a human making that decision. So I talk about this stuff more in the um, um, lesson 13 of my engineering ethics uh, lectures um, on uh, autonomy and especially military autonomy, uh, autonomous military robots. Okay, so uh, uh, these applications, these technologies have applications in policing and security, um, but they also have much broader application uh, to things like uh, in the justice system, to things like criminal criminal sentencing, uh, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But also things like loan applications. Banks are deciding who to grant loans to and who to reject for a loan um, on the basis of machine learning software that's that they've trained up um, uh, in various ways. Um, also things like hiring decisions, um, college acceptances. Um, co colleges are increasingly using AI software. Uh, to decide who to accept to their college. Um, same thing with businesses deciding who to hire. Um, so this kind of technology ends up affecting a lot of people, um, and it's important to know how it works and what impact it'll have on our lives. So um, let's just talk about some uh, cases of this. So uh, let's, let's start by thinking about uh, mass surveillance in China. China has one of the um, largest mass surveillance systems uh, where there's cameras all over the place on the streets and so on, and the cameras are... Um, uh, equipped with uh, uh, detection technology um, uh, where they can take a uh, full motion video and not only spot where all the people are in the video, but also identify who those people are 
um, follow them across multiple cameras, um, um, and also not just uh, who they are, but things like what they're doing. Right? The, the, the system knows that this person is getting to a cab, and it knows which cab it is. It knows that these people are riding bikes. Uh, um, it, it can also do things like describe what they're we wearing, um, um, maybe how old they are, um, their gender, uh, these kinds of things. So uh, China has this very elaborate system um, for surveillance, for monitoring people, and there have been stories of uh, successes um, I guess you could call them um, things like a wanted criminal who had been um, on the run from the police uh, goes to some major, um, uh, I think it was a music event, it was like a concert at a, at a, start, at a, a stadium, um, so, so some major public event, and there were enough cameras around that the cameras caught the person, recognized who it was, and the police were there by the time the person left. So even in this extremely crowded environment, um, uh, an individual doesn't, doesn't go unseen. Right? The, the police can track on an individual basis so who's there, um, and what, what they're wanted for. And this system in China is hooked into their social credit system. So the social credit system is everyone has a, a credit score, and it's not just about your financial credit, but it's about your social credit, uh, which means like how well are you obeying the laws. Um, if you do things that are against the law, you can get penalized and face kind of certain kinds of social uh, penalties. So for instance, if you uh, cross the street uh, illegally, like jaywalked, it wasn't your turn, there wasn't a light for you to cross, we crossed anyway. So um, in some intersections in China, uh, near the intersection will be a big billboard, um, and it'll plaster your face in the billboard and uh, signal that you're a, a, a jaywalker to everyone around. Um, but also you might get demerits in your social credit, and if you get enough demerits, maybe you are restricted from using public transportation. You can't ride the subways, you can't ride the train, because you have too low of a social credit score. Um, this kind of technology is already being used in China. It's already how the technology works, how the government is uh, ma managing them. And, uh, you know, um, okay, so, uh, <coughs> so so this is a technology that's already up and running. And uh, there are all sorts of ethical concerns you might have about these technologies in general. Maybe it doesn't have specifically to do with AI. It just so happens that they're using um, machine learning techniques in order to do this kind of uh, algorithmic analysis. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, ethical questions and um, legal questions uh, about uh, um, how, how this stuff works. Um, but uh, let me show a, a more insidious application of this uh, technology, which is uh, uh, this paper. Um, this is not a good paper, uh, so I, I'm not endorsing this paper. But paper from a couple of years ago by some researchers in China um, who were uh, um, using machine learning algorithms to determine uh, based on someone's facial structure, whether they're uh, potentially a criminal. So um, this is just a machine learning algorithm. You can make a machine learning algorithm, uh, algorithm learn whatever you want. You can give it a data set and have it classify that data set by whatever metrics you want. Um, and uh, maybe that system is interesting or maybe it isn't. Um, you don't really know, but you, you can build these systems to classify data in, in basically any manner you want. So what these researchers did is they took a big database of mug shots um, uh, and uh, from, from criminals, from prisoners, from people who were in jail. Um, and then they compared that to a bunch of faces who are not in jail. Um, and they trained a machine learning algorithm to be able to sort the people um, who were in jail from people who weren't in jail. Uh, and then, uh, and then they, they uh, advertised this technology as uh, being able to spot criminal uh, criminality by just looking at someone's face. Okay, this is scary stuff, so let me be absolutely clear, 100% clear, that there's no correlation, there's no relationship whatsoever between the structure of someone's face and whether they're a criminal. Um, no correlation whatsoever. Uh, the, the structure of your face has nothing to do with whether you're a criminal. Um, but uh, you can still train a machine learning algorithm to do whatever function you want, and so if you want to try to find a line between faces uh, that have been... Uh, convicted of a crime and those that haven't. Um, you know, maybe there is some function that you can draw there. Uh, maybe that function doesn't hold very well, so like, you can't apply it to determine whether uh, a new face that you see is going to be a criminal or not. But you can use, um, even though there's no uh, scientific justification for this, even though there's no uh, ethical justification for this, you can still nevertheless unethically use this to uh, more or less arbitrarily say that certain people are criminals or not. Right? So this kind of thing um, is not ethically good, but it might be attractive to certain government governments who want uh, an excuse to target certain people. Um, it, it is probably not surprising that the uh, gradation here between criminal faces and non-criminal faces is also going to lie along uh, uh, class lines and other kinds of social uh, divisions. Um, 
so China has been using these kinds of facial recognition technologies to uh, detain uh, its Muslim citizens. Chinese Muslims have been uh, uh, rounded up in, in, into concentration camps over the last few years, um, and uh, uh, China has been using facial um, recognition technology to determine who's a Muslim and who should be thrown in, the, in these camps. So uh, this is bad stuff. I, I want to just link this uh, quickly to uh, uh, phrenology. Phrenology is this um, discredited uh, pseudoscience that used to be practiced for a long time, uh, where um, people used to think that the lumps in your head or the structure of your skull had something to do with uh, your personality and maybe even uh, your fate, like what happened, will happen to you in your future? Will, will you get a good job or, or whatever? Um, and uh, right, so the idea was by feeling little bumps and lumps and divots in your skull, um, and uh, if those bumps are in certain places, um, that has implications for your personality and so on. So uh, this this is also a, this is uh, not good science. This is bad science. It's pseudoscience. Um, uh, it's discredited science. You shouldn't believe it. Um, but people did believe this. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that people believe this is sort of turned into a, a kind of quasi or pseudoscientific enterprise was because it fit nicely and is really a sort of uh, logical extension of the um, scientific racism uh, that was practiced th throughout much of col uh, colonialism. Right? So, so there was this belief uh, by European scientists, this untrue belief um, that you could determine the amount of rationality on the basis of uh, skull shape and that, moreover, that Europeans have the most rational uh, skull um, and that uh, maybe African, uh, Africans have a sort of primitive skull that's more related to, like, chimpanzees or whatever. Right? So, so the idea is that um, the skull shape has uh, uh, implications for rationality and for sort of uh, civilization, for sophistication, um, that Europeans have this idealized skull. Right? So if you believe in this kind of scientific racism, which you should not, um, this is this is bad stuff. Uh, this, these are bad ideas. But if you believe, if if you lived at the time where people believed in the scientific racism, then it seems to suggest that differences in skull shape have implications for differences in rationality and personality, and so on. Right. And so phrenology grows out of this underlying belief in scientific racism. The scientific racism. Uh, exists almost entirely to justify uh, these colonialist practices, uh, like like the African slave trade. Right? Um, um, uh, Europeans sort of uh, uh, dr dreamt up um, uh, uh, these sort of racist categories in order to justify their practices of um, slavery and colonialism. If they're inferior, then uh, maybe it's not so bad that we uh, enslave these people. Of course, it's really. Of course, Africans are not inferior in any way. Um, uh, it is bad to enslave these people, but these are the kinds of justifications that Europeans came up with in order to uh, maintain their policies. And uh, what I want to say is that these kinds of facial recognition technologies used to determine criminality—it's just this, it's just the same thing. It's just the same kind of uh, um, racist, self-justifying uh, pseudoscience um, that's used to. Uh, um, they, 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 that's used to justify these, these horrific uh, practices, deeply unethical practices. Um, so uh, maybe you're not so shocked to hear about surveillance and uh, these ethical abuses happening in China, but of course these things are happening in the United States as well. Um, police departments around the United States are using facial recognition technologies um, in order to determine who's uh, a potential criminal, um, what their properties are. Uh, uh, the link uh, down here, the mass surveillance link, uh, I have is to a article in The Intercept talking about um, uh, IBM software used to uh, uh, analyze video um, and the software um, uh, will sort people into uh, racial and ethnic categories. Um, the software itself determines who's black and who's white, who's uh, Asian, uh, and uh, you know, using characteristics that it sees in the video. Um, and then cops might use this information in order to decide um, how to police the situation. So if the algorithms are telling you that this person is black or this person is white, that might have a big impact on how the policing operates. Um, and this is uh, increasingly baked into how um, uh, high-tech policing in the 21st century um, works. Um, uh, maybe it's worth mentioning, so IBM, like I said, was, was working with the NYPD um, in order to develop this technology. Um, uh, basically, the NYPD was just giving IBM access to all of its security cameras um, so that it can help train its software that, among other things, uh, sorts people by their ethnicities. Uh, it's maybe also worth mentioning here that IBM um, has a long history of working with uh, 
uh, working with governments to police their citizens. Um, IBM uh, was around during World War II and provided Nazi Germany with lots of uh, computing resources um, in order to manage its uh, various tasks, including the Holocaust. So, so you might know from seeing World War II documentaries um, that uh, uh, Jews who survived the Holocaust uh, sometimes have uh, barcodes or numbers um, tattooed on them. Um, and this is because the uh, German uh, 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 genocide was... Uh, extremely high-tech process. Um, they had bo they they documented um, all the people that they were moving around to the their various death camps, and uh, they uh, kept track of it with the kind of efficiency that you might expect of a modern business, like modern international shipping business. And this is part of why the World War II, why the Holocaust is, is so horrific. Not not just the sheer number of people that died, but the ruthless sort of efficiency, the mechanical efficiency and industrialized efficiency uh, with which the Germans carried out this horrific. Uh, uh, process. So uh, IBM contributed the computers that the Germans used to do all this sort of bookkeeping. Um, the Holocaust was carried out on IBM computing machines. So IBM has this history. They, they don't like to talk about it very much, but IBM has this history and they've, uh, they continue to work with police, uh, with police and other governments in order to um, develop these kinds of surveillance technologies, uh, these people management technologies. Um, a related uh, case um, it, uh, related to the criminal justice sort of system. Um, this is not a surveillance technology, but this is uh, it has to do with uh, criminal sentencing. This is a very famous uh, ProPublica article, Machine Bias. Um, basically, everyone in AI ethics knows about this article. I think this is from 2016. Uh, ProPublica is a uh, investigative journalism outfit, and they uh, report in this article on uh, North Point's Compass algorithm. So North Point is a, a corporation that develops this algorithm, uh, the Compass algorithm's correctional offender management profiling for alternative sanctions system. Um, and uh, what the Compass system does is it's a risk assessment tool used by judges in criminal sentencing, uh, in the criminal sentencing process. So uh, criminal sentencing is, is after you have, uh, so someone commits a crime and then there's a trial and the jury finds the person guilty of the crime. Um, and then after, after they're found guilty, the judge uh, is responsible for sentencing the criminal. And uh, there's all sorts of ethical and political issues with the sentencing procedures that are already in place. They're biased for lots of reasons. Um, and so uh, uh, maybe uh, as an attempt to stop these kinds of biases and to help make the sentencing procedure more fair, um, uh, North Point uh, developed this compass system to do a risk assessment of uh, criminals uh, based, on their, uh, based on their case record, what crimes have they committed in the past. So uh, you feed in the past crimes of the criminal and the compass spits out a risk score uh, based on uh, trying to determine how likely it is that they will go on to commit crimes. And this tool is already used in many states, um, uh, uh, se several states uh, uh, that are listed in the machine uh, bias uh, article, not New Jersey, but se several other states are already employing, uh, as of 2016, we're already employing this tool for criminal sentencing. Uh, let me say that again. Um, in the United States, it's already the case that criminals are sentenced by AI. Like the AI is deciding how long you're going to be staying in jail. And if that's not scary enough, uh, you should actually look at how the Compass system operates. So uh, the machine bias article goes into some detail, and this is the uh, uh, more detailed analysis of how they um, analyze the Compass system. So, but this is one one example of how the analysis goes. So here's uh, Vernon uh, Vernon's prior offenses, where he he was guilty of two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery. Um, uh, but the Compass system evaluated him as being at low risk, um, and when he was released, he went on to commit one grand offense. So it seems like uh, maybe that low risk score was uh, too optimistic for Vernon. Uh, but in contrast, here's Brisha. Um, Brisha's prior offenses included four juvenile misdemeanors, uh, but she was judged as a high risk offender. Um, she was penalized uh, with a harsher sentence, but uh, when Brisha was eventually released from pr from prison, she was not she did not go on to commit any crimes. So it seems uh, from the actual case record where Vernon does go on to commit crimes and Brisha doesn't that uh, Vernon should have been judged as high risk and Brisha should have been judged as low risk. But the Compass system gets the exact opposite um, result. Why does it get the exact opposite result? Well, because the Compass system was trained on the history of criminal sentencing. So they took uh, uh, several years, several cases uh, of judges having given sentences to different criminals. 
um, and they built a uh, machine learning algorithm that tries to replicate as close as possible this history of criminal sentencing. And again, the history of criminal sentencing is an incredibly biased, racist, prejudiced thing um, where uh, minorities are more likely to receive harsh sentences than their white counterparts. Um, so um, it's how the actual criminal justice system has historically behaved that Brisha would get risk, uh, judged higher risk and Vernon would get judged lower risk. Um, so in, in other words, the system isn't making a mistake. The system here it actually is reflecting the, uh, what a judge might do in these situations. And it sort of exposes just how uh, unethical, how uh, uh, broken the criminal justice system is, especially along racial and gender uh, dimensions. Um, and uh, when you take this history of prejudice and bias and you use it to train artificial intelligence, it's no surprise that the artificial intelligence just replicates all of this history of bias and prejudice. And if that's not bad enough, uh, North Point is a private company. Um, their algorithms are proprietary. Um, we don't have access. So ProPublica had to sort of reverse engineer the software in order to determine how uh, it was making these assessments. Um, but it didn't have access to the source code. Uh, this is proprietary software that people don't, uh, aren't allowed to see what, uh, what algorithms they're using in order to determine this risk assessment. Um, and because it's a private company, because it's, it's this private contracting company, there's also no democratic oversight in uh, how, how they're developing the systems, how they work, um, whether they actually reflect the law, whether they re reflect the will of the people. Um, all of this stuff is sort of outside of democratic, uh, the, the, the control of the democratic process. Um, so this, this stuff is all very scary, and like I said, this has been in operation since 2016. Um, this stuff is um, already uh, uh, an, an issue. Um. Now, you, you might think, uh, you might respond to this kind of case and say, well, AI shouldn't be doing these, shouldn't be making these kinds of decisions. Maybe AI shouldn't be uh, deciding how long people go to jail or, or whether someone gets a loan or whether someone gets hired. Right? Maybe AI should not be making these decisions. So you, so you might think that the ethical failure is in using AI to make these decisions at all. Like these are not the sort of decisions that we should be letting AI make. Um, but a lot of people... Uh, uh, a lot of people want to accept that um, the technology might have application or might have a legitimate application, and the goal is not to stop AI from making these decisions, but instead to make the AI make better decisions. Right? So how can we develop AI that um, actually will make fair decisions, maybe that can actually correct for these historical injustices? Right? Um, how do we train AI to not replicate all of our uh, racist mistakes? Um, so, so this brings to the second brings me to the second question, um, the question about uh, how these algorithms and training data are used. Um, right. So, uh, for instance, uh, we might start by asking, what is the source of training data? Um, uh, where where are we getting the data from? Um, is that data reliable? Right. So, if if we're judging whether someone's going to be a criminal on the basis of how judges have decided um, in the past or how police officers. Um, have enforced the law, uh, maybe that data is already sort of inherently biased. Um, um, and maybe automating it sort of further entrenches those biases um, into, the, into the process. Like, you know, maybe it's easy to point out when some judge is being racist. Uh, I, I don't, it, it, it isn't so easy, but you might think it's not so impossible to imagine recognizing that a judge is making racist decisions and then holding that judge accountable. But uh, when that uh, process, when that bias process is uh, automated into an algorithm and that algorithm is deployed widely across many different states, it has far greater impact than any single uh, racist judge. Um, right, so uh, how do we account for these potential structural biases in the training data? How do we uh, find good data? Um, how do we make sure that these biases aren't being replicated in the machines that we're building? Um, sometimes this is hard. Sometimes it's uh, counterintuitive. So uh, uh, you might think that one way of correcting for this is making sure that things aren't racist is just by not tracking race. If we if we just don't have race as one of the parameters, you know, uh, or gender or whatever, if if we just uh, exclude this as one of the parameters from our model, then maybe this prevents us from being racist. But uh, part of the challenge is that these, these biases are systemic and they get hidden in the data in all sorts of ways. So for instance, if I have a data set that includes people's zip codes, uh, you know, where they live, well, uh, there's a lot of segregation in this country. Um, zip code is 
often a useful proxy for determining someone's race, their class, their uh, uh, their wealth. Um, and so if I am using uh, data that's coded by zip code, um, I might end up discovering certain kinds of racial biases or class biases, and, uh, wealth disparity biases, um, that are uh, sort of baked in or hidden in the zip code data. So, uh, you know, maybe if I'm if I'm giving out loans and I decide never to give out loans, you know, I decide that some zip code is full of risky people and I just won't give uh, uh, loans to those people. Um, well, it turns out that that may, maybe that zip code is also, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, pr predominantly some minority community. Um, uh, then then maybe there's a core. So uh, even though I'm basing my model on zip code, which doesn't seem like it has anything to do with race, well, in fact, it does have a lot to do with race. Uh, and so we want to make sure that when we're building these models, we're not just not just uh, eliminating the explicit biases, but also accounting for implicit biases, biases that are uh, sort of hidden hidden in the data. Um, this sort of look for uh, debiasing our data has generated in AI ethics dozens, uh, literally dozens of different definitions of fairness. You know, fairness in what respect? Is it fairness because everything's even? Is it fairness because it compensates for other injustices? Right. So, uh, right, so uh, lots of different definitions of fairness have been proposed um, and deployed in these various algorithms. And uh, that discussion of fairness can get a little bit confusing in the literature, um, but, uh, but that's, that's where we are. Um, another dimension of this is uh, about, so not just the training data and whether there's biases in the training data, but also does the resulting system do what we want? Does it do what we expect? Um, sometimes this is put in terms of a, a value alignment. Does the machine al align with our values? And the, uh, the, the important point here is that um, sometimes you can get a machine that does some things in some cases, but maybe in certain edge cases it does other things that you don't expect. Um, uh, this is a, a tr traditional sort of problem with AI ethics. Um, uh, the example um, that I normally talk, I'm not going to look for the video now, but it is of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice. So the Sorcerer's Apprentice uh, uh, trains its, um, its broom to uh, uh, get, gather water from the well, uh, sort of magic up its broom to gather water from the well, and uh, it teaches it how to uh, fill the well with water, but it doesn't teach it how to stop filling the well, and so when Mickey Mouse falls asleep, the broom ends up overflowing the well and causing all sorts of havoc, and and uh, this is often explained in terms of uh, misalignment with value, so so Mickey was able to teach the broom uh, to do some of some of Mickey's values, like how to fill the well, but not all of Mickey's values. And one of Mickey's very important values is when to stop filling the well. And if you don't teach that value to the machine, the machine ends up behaving very different than what you would expect. Right? It's sort of intuitive that the machine would stop when the well is full, but if you don't tell the machine to do that explicitly, then it might do something else. Um, so uh, this notion of alignment with our values, you might hear some undertones of something like the Turing test, where the Turing test is looking at whether the machine behaves like another human. Uh, some researchers have talked about a moral Turing test, where the issue is not just does, does the machine behave like a human, but does the machine uh, express the same kind of values that a human would have um, in, in, in particular cases. Um, this issue of alignment, uh, you might also uh, recognize some of the justification for the moral machine project. This is the, the uh, tr uh, trolley problem uh, 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 test where do you make the uh, self-driving car, do you make it swerve right, or do you make it hit the pedestrians? Right, so uh, the moral machine experiment was designed to get a lot of people to answer these questions in order to figure out how people make decisions and then presumably build a machine that aligns with those with those morals. Right, so these kinds of experimental uh, uh, data gathering uh, projects like the moral machine um, are sometimes framed in terms of uh, value alignment. Um, this is a, another major part of AI ethics. Um, one, one last thing to mention here is about explainable AI. So uh, when we're talking about uh, neural networks, these deep, deep learning networks that are huge, that have lots of nodes, lots of layers, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to understand exactly what's going on in the model, um, exactly why it is that the machine works the way it does. Uh, you might remember from our demo um, with the uh, 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 TensorFlow Playground um, that the, the network had all these intermediate representations, and the intermediate representations were sometimes very obscure and they, not, not really clear how it contributes to the overall system. Um, you can tell when the neural network gets the right solution to the, to the data set, when it, when it classifies the data in the right way, but you might not be able to tell how it got to that solution 
or um, why it is that this you know why, why does this node have this value? Why does why is the, why is there this pattern of connections between these nodes? Um, so, sometimes this stuff might not might be obscure even to the designers of the machine. Uh, and you might think that well it doesn't matter how the machine operates. What really matters is that it gets the right answer. Um, and a lot of AI was has been developed uh, just trying to get uh, good results, uh, even if it doesn't make sense how it got those results. But again, this might uh, result in these edge cases where the machine behaves other than how we expect. And so a lot of AI ethicists have been emphasizing the importance of explainability, that not only should the system get a result, but it should be able to explain how it got that result in a way that we can understand. So for instance, if I uh, go, uh, submit for a loan for a loan to the bank and the bank's AI system rejects me, um, can it tell me why it rejected me? Like, like, can it explain to me what I would have to do in order to get, get a loan the next time I apply? Or, you know, what uh, specific uh, criteria am I missing, right? Uh, you might think that it's really important to give people this kind of feedback, but if you can't explain how the AI works, then you can't give this feedback. So there's been a lot of uh, attempts in AI ethics to build these explainable AI models, uh, uh, neural networks that have a kind of ex uh, sort of rational decomposition where you can explain what, what's going on at every step um, so, so that you, you get an understandable uh, result. result. Uh, so all of these link to... Um, different things that you might uh, sort of explore further. Um, let me give you some demos of this, though. So here's the first demo. Uh, I'm going to let the, this is just a minute long, so I'm going to let the speakers in the video talk about it. Nice. OK, Noel, you try now. One to your honey. Two black. Two black. Yeah. What Come, again. Again. Come again, Sashi. Whoa. Nah, you too back over way. Yeah, what yeah. I can do is to get to, yeah, to get yeah, to yeah. get yeah. 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 what do you have to do? That's how racial this thing is. Yeah. I have to use that piece of white. Let's see a napkin. I'll ah, show it again. Pay up, pay up, pay up again. Napkin again. Right, pay up. What is it called? I'm a hand. Man, man, you black man, you're in fight. Black man, you're in fight. All over, all over, all over. All over. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a soap dispenser that would not um, dispense soap to the black hand. Um, uh, nice. Okay. It worked for the white white guy's hand at the beginning, dispense soap, no problem. But the black person sticking his hand, his normal human hand under the soap dispenser, um, is not dispensing soap. So I, I have the title here, Racist Soap Dispenser, but... Um, uh, ho hopefully it's clear that it's not the soap dispenser having racist attitudes towards uh, black people. This is not because the soap dispenser believes any racist, anything racist. It doesn't have beliefs at all. This is just a sensor. And what's going on here is that the sensor has been calibrated by the engineers who built it. It's been calibrated to respond to white hands, probably because all the engineers who built this were, were uh, white people with, with hands that it, it worked, right? So when, when they tested it, it works for them. So it's, they thought it works fine. Um, but when you put it out in the real world um, with people who don't look like the engineers, um, then, it, then it stops working. Right? So here, um, maybe it's not the soap dispenser that's racist. And uh, we, we might even want to give the benefit of the doubt to the engineers who built this. You know, maybe they're all not racist either. Maybe they don't have any racist thoughts. Uh, maybe they wanted their product to work for everyone, and they just were sort of uh, 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 blind or ignorant to, to, this, uh, to this use case. Uh, but... Uh, so, so this isn't um, racism at the level of individual beliefs. Right? This isn't someone having negative, uh, negative attitude towards any particular race. Um, this is something more like systemic racism. Um, this has to do with the fact of uh, you know who is becoming an engineer to design these sorts of things and who isn't. Um, right? Um, it's it's because uh, mostly white people are becoming engineers and minorities um, are becoming engineers at a much uh, lower rate that you end up having these kinds of results. Um, and I want to emphasize this is not unique at all to uh, modern AI. Um, if you look at, for instance, the, uh, the history of uh, uh, film and photography, the, the Kodak uh, film color palette was calibrated to uh, white skin tones. And so uh, for a long time, the, the colored and Kodak film um, it would not pick up uh, black, uh, uh, black skin or black faces very well. It would sort of distort them. It, it, uh, the color palette in those shades was not well developed for the Kodak film. Um, it was calibrated and designed uh, specifically to uh, look good with uh, white skin tones, um, and so black skin tones just sort of fell away. Uh, this soap dispenser case is sort of a similar kind of case um, that the sensors are calibrated with a very narrow population in mind, and it doesn't work for everyone. 
And so the problem here isn't about racist beliefs. The problem here is systemic racism. That uh, for one thing, we need more people in the design process, um, in the engineering design process. Right? If there were some black hands um, uh, helping out in the design of that uh, sensor, then maybe someone would have caught much earlier that this design doesn't work. So this is why um, um, increasing the diversity in STEM fields um, is an ethical issue. It's not just about, uh, it's not just a sort of a, a, a political issue. Uh, um, it, it's, an, it's an ethical issue. It, it, it's about uh, whether these machines end up working in the, in, out in the world. Um, uh, so this is a sort of simple example. The, oops, um, um, the same basic point gets expanded out uh, quite elaborately by Joy uh, Bulamwini, um, who's a postdoc at MIT. Um, she was in the uh, computer science department, in engineering department, uh, but um, uh, she was trying to uh, build software that did facial recognition that would detect her face, and she was using off-the-shelf uh, open, uh, open source software that she was um, using. And when her friends got in front of the camera, saw their face, no problem, but when she got in front of the camera, it would not it did not recognize her face. Um, this might be an issue with skin tone. It might also... I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, but we know uh, why it's a problem, because, it, it, again, this software doesn't work for everyone. And this is not just the unique software that she's using. Uh, uh, Joy goes on, and this is part of what her research is about. It is about how uh, this is, in fact, the case for almost all of the major uh, companies building this kind of facial detection software or image recognition software um, is that they cannot uh, recognize black faces, um, they cannot uh, accurately distinguish uh, women's faces from men's faces, um, or they only do that for a very narrow subset of, of people. The data sets that they're using are very narrow, and so uh, they end up getting these very biased results. Um, Joy uh, and her team uh, ran some of uh, uh, this facial recognition software against members of Congress and uh, it determined that uh, 31 uh, members of Congress were criminals uh, based on their uh, facial detection, based on these facial detection algorithms, I think based on Amazon's facial detection algorithm. Uh, so um, this stuff doesn't work, and it has all of these uh, dr dramatic ethical implications. Um, I encourage you to watch these uh, videos of joy. Um, but um, even outside of this uh, race context, um, there's just a, a general safety issue um, at stake here. So here's a, uh, this is a somewhat old uh, paper, but um, the, uh, the researchers uh, reverse engineered the uh, uh, facial recognition or the visual detection algorithms in um, some self-driving car software. So the, the cars, self-driving cars, um, they use image detection algorithms in order to determine that there's a stop sign versus a speed limit sign um, in order to read the uh, street signs. And if you know how the neural network functions, then you can build these tools that fool the, net, uh, fool the uh, uh, neural network in reliable ways. So on top here, uh, just putting these white and black markers on top of the stop sign um, makes the neural network misclassify that stop sign as a 45 mile an hour uh, speed limit sign. So in other words, a self-driving car driving past that stop sign would not see the stop sign. They would see a 45 mile an hour speed limit sign and they would just keep driving right through it. Now, obviously that's very dangerous. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, especially dangerous because it's not obvious what that does to us. So this is part. This is part of this explainability thing. Like, why does that change the neural network from seeing a stop sign to uh, to seeing a, a speed limit sign? Who, who knows, right? Uh, we don't know what the uh, details of the algorithm are that generate this um, uh, uh, these results. Yeah, it, it, but it is manipulable in these regular ways. Um, so. Uh, this is not at all how human visual system works, right? Uh, you can put a couple of markers over the stop sign, and we still recognize it's a stop sign just covered with stickers. But covering a stickers, covering a stop sign with stickers to an AI might result in all sorts of different behavior. So this kind of stuff is dangerous. It's important to know um, if this is a possibility. Um, important to be able to anticipate when it might happen or how it might be abused. Um, and this brings me to the third uh, part, uh, which is about the legal and regulatory environment, right? So who's checking to make sure that these uh, systems are safe, that they're reliable, that they can be used in public context without uh, exposing the general public to danger, to um, other, so other sorts of risks, um, risks to their privacy and security, for instance. Um, what methods do we have to hold people accountable for their actions if they do commit some uh, violation of the public trust, if they do engage in destructive or harmful behavior? 
Uh, and uh, along these lines, I think it's important to note that there's almost no regulatory framework in the United States to govern the way that big tech companies use their data. Um, uh, this is this is true for self-driving cars. Um, there's almost no regulations on what self-driving cars can or cannot do. Uh, there are regulations at state level, but almost no federal regulations. Um, there are some federal regulations, but not much about uh, the use of drones. Um, there's almost no uh, restrictions on what Facebook can do with your data or what uh, Google can do with your data. Um, um, and uh, the use and misuse of this data has huge consequences for the public. Um, the maybe the most important one in recent memory is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where Facebook uh, gave over a lot of private data of its users, like lots and lots of data of its users, uh, to a private company that uh, ended up using that data to manipulate elections. Um, so Cambridge Analytica was a company that uh, 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 the Republicans were using to target advertising um, in certain places, and it helped, it helped swing an election. Uh, and uh, Facebook uh, gave this data up. Um, there was actually, it wasn't that Cambridge Analytica stole this data, it was part of Facebook's terms and services that this data was made available in this way. And Facebook had almost no penalties from, uh, f from this uh, serious violation of public trust. In fact, F Facebook is still able to manipulate um, uh, ma manipulate its network for political purposes in the same way that it could in 2016. Right? So these, these kinds of big gaps in our uh, policy um, are, uh, are very dangerous. Now, th these gaps don't, uh, aren't, uh, these same gaps aren't uh, everywhere in the world. Um, in particular, the EU has been rather proactive in developing uh, regulatory guidelines about the use of digital technologies. Um, a couple of years ago, you might remember the EU released the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. This is the suite of policies that the EU has on what uh, companies can do, what they uh, cannot do, uh, what they have to do for its users. Um, uh, one famous thing that is in the GDPR is this uh, right to be forgotten. So if people request that information is removed from Facebook servers or from Google search results, uh, uh, in, in Europe, in the EU, uh, uh, citizens of the EU have the right to be forgotten, have the right to request that these tech companies get rid of their data, and the tech companies are obligated to um, comply with these requests um, or be penalized with fines and other uh, sorts of um, uh, penalties. So uh, Facebook and other big tech companies have been fined, have been uh, uh, brought to court and um, uh, uh, made to account for various violations of people's uh, data. Um, but these same laws don't exist in the United States, so uh, Facebook can do a lot more in the United States. Uh, now, uh, a lot of the big tech companies like Facebook and Google, um, because they also operate in the EU pretty extensively, have updated their own internal policies to more closely reflect the, the GDPR, which is really the world's strongest set of regulations on, on this kind of digital technologies. Um, so um, it, it's the case that a lot of uh, uses of these applications in the United States um, uh, are within GDPR guidelines, but there's not a legal requirement that they that they um, must be so, and uh, the restrictions in the United States are a lot weaker um, than what the GDPR demands. For that matter, the GDPR is not the strongest thing in the world. There are reasons to complain about how uh, strong the GDPR is also, but given that it's one of the only um, effective regulatory frameworks for digital technologies. It, it's a good model for thinking about what's possible. Um, all right, so uh, I, I just raised a bunch of questions and gave some case studies and pointed you in some, some different directions. Um, uh, uh, that's mostly what I wanted to do. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is, is uh, uh, facial recognition technologies uh, directly. So I've, I've mentioned facial recognition technologies uh, and their use in a couple of different ways, but um, it, f facial recognition tech has been uh, really the front lines in the political battle over AI. Uh, it's uh, a lot of the um, uh, laws restricting uh, AI use have been around facial recognition technology. So, for instance, a couple of uh, uh, months ago, I want to say maybe maybe last year, um, San Francisco banned. Uh, face recognition technology in its city um, f uh, in the sense that it can't be used by any city agency. Uh, so the government can't, uh, the San Francisco government cannot use facial recognition technologies, including the police force. Um, all the police have little cameras on, but they're not allowed to uh, uh, do facial recognition technology um, on, on their cameras. Um, so uh, this was the first of its kind uh, since, since San Francisco did this. A few other cities, major cities, have uh, followed suit 
um, also banning facial recognition technology. And it's caused a little bit of controversy in the popular discussion. So I have here uh, an argument in favor of these facial recognition bans um, in New York Magazine. And I also have a New York Times op-ed um, against the facial recognition bans. Um, I want to clarify one more time that this is a ban not for people to use facial recognition technology. Like if you use uh, the facial facial detection on your iPhone in order to unlock your iPhone, that's that's still legal. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, but. Uh, uh, in San Francisco, uh, the, the law here is not about whether you can use those tools. Um, the law is about whether the city can use the tools, um, whether the police force can use the tools, and San Francisco ruled that, they, that it can't. So uh, so lots of other cities and lots of other communities are debating the merits of these facial recognition bans. Um, and I have a pro and a con on this uh, topic f to get both sides. I'm, I'm on the pro side. I'll just say it right, right after that. Um, the common refrain among the AI ethics community is that there's no, there's no ethical use of facial recognition technologies. Um, that should be banned sort of across the board. So uh, in, in this light, maybe we should consider some non-governmental uses. So, so not just can the city use it. You know, maybe it's more straightforward that the police should not be using facial recognition technologies. But what about cities? What about private citizens? Well, uh, in, the United, in, I'm sorry, in uh, New York City, um, there, were, uh, there was some controversy around landlords installing facial recognition technologies um, on their apartment buildings or condo buildings so that the tenants have to use, have to, have to get their face scanned in order to enter the building. Um, in, instead of using a key to unlock a door, um, you have to stand in front of a camera and then it scans your face. And if it recognizes you, then it lets you in. Um, and uh, recently, the tenants, uh, various tenants associations uh, complained. They got laws uh, put uh, passed um, to prevent uh, landlords from installing facial recognition technologies. This is the Keys Act. The Keys is keep entry to your home uh, surveillance free. And uh, just recently, um, the tenants associations got the Keys Act passed, and so now it's considered a tenant right to have a physical key that is given to you by the landlord, um, and that uh, uh, landlords are not allowed to install facial recognition technology without the consent of the tenants. Um, uh, so. Uh, this isn't about restricting the government use. This is, in some sense, restricting the private citizen's use. But uh, because they're a landlord, they have certain obligations to their tenants. And uh, uh, sorting that out is, is the, the basis of this controversy. There's practical concerns about replacing your, uh, the key on your door with the facial recognition software. Um, for one thing, like what, what if the camera breaks or what if there's, you know, someone scratches on the, on the lens and so it can't see you, right? Um, so how do you get it in your building in, in these cases? Um, you know, if a lock breaks, then you can call a locksmith and you can jimmy open your door. But what if the uh, what if the software breaks? Who do you call then? Is it a proprietary service? Um, do you have to be charged by some uh, a licensed tech who works for that company in order to fix your door? Um, also, what about you know people's faces change over time? Um, what if I was wearing a beard when you first got my picture and uh, and then I shave my face? Do you not recognize me anymore? Um, what if people are wearing masks like everyone's wearing masks right now? Uh, the facial recognition technologies are not going to work very well if everyone's in a mask. Right, so th these are just sort of practical concerns about whether it actually makes sense to put uh, this tech, uh, to use this tech in order to open your front door. But there's also like privacy concerns. Um, it's usually uh, the, these, uh, the, the software, the, the, these uh, the hardware and software that's put on these doors is uh, contracted out by private companies. Um, the private companies usually keep the biometric data, the pictures of your face, um, and the analysis of your face, and you know who's who's attended and so on. Um, uh, right, so so who who's Who's taking that data? Um, how is that data being protected? Um, that's biometric data. That's, that's information about your biological uh, properties. Um, that's uh, a bio it's, it's sensitive data. Um, uh, if that data gets stolen, people might be able to impersonate you and that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, uh, and, and if this is if, if all that data is being stored by some private contracting company that's that's just uh, operating the security system on your building, um, that's not uh, that's not a lot of security for the tenants uh, to be able to trust that they can enter their building to be able to trust that that data is being protected. All right, so the Keys Act is designed to stop that all at the pass and say, look, uh, ten uh, landlords just cannot install this technology at the front door. Um, Maybe this kind of problem is something uh, somewhat unique to New York City because of the living situation of a lot of New Yorkers. Maybe this same kind of law doesn't uh, make sense in other contexts or other cities or, um, or more rural areas. But, uh, but what do you think? Um, is, is there a case to be made for facial recognition technologies? Um, where, in, in what context, um, what protection should be associated with it? Um, 
Good. Uh, so uh, the last thing I'm going to say here is just I have a bunch of resources for you to learn more. This is really just introduction and overview um, to the topic of AI ethics. There's a lot to say here, though. I think the best resource to go to um, for information on AI ethics is uh, AI Now, which is a think tank at NYU. Uh, it's led by uh, Kate Crawford and Meredith Whitaker. Uh, Meredith Whitaker uh, used to be at Google, and she was recently fired from Google for helping to organize some uh, labor walkouts um, over last year. Uh, so she's working at AI now full time. These people are on the front lines of a lot of these uh, uh, debates. Um, uh, they also put out a report every year. So I have here linked the 2019 report and the 2018 report. Um, and uh, along with these reports, they have these really awesome uh, uh, visualizations of all of the uh, AI ethics related um, controversies over the years. So these are a bunch of stories, headlines, um, and so on of things that happened in 2018. I'm sorry, in 2019 from October 2018 to October 2019, um, related to AI. This has to do with things like um, um, uh, tech companies working with ICE or with the NYPD or with uh, other uh, uh, security and military institutions. Uh, this has to do with uh, the um, facial recognition technology bans, um, um, things with uh, the use of robots. Uh, so uh, lots of information here. Um, uh, the reports are very good. I strongly recommend you read the reports. Um, they also give a yearly event uh, when they release their reports where they sort of go over some of the information in the report. This is the event from 2019. Um, and one of the things they had here is a lot of the people from the Tenants Association that were fighting the facial recognition technologies. They, they came and gave a little panel discussion. Um, so this report is really good. Uh, the uh, event is worth watching if you're interested in this stuff. Um, this, it really gives you an insight into the, the cutting edge of AI ethics. Um, here's a couple of other videos. Um, this video has a lot of uh, AI ethics um, that are good and sort of, sort of gives a, a, another sort of brief overview into the kind of things I've been talking about for the last hour. Um, here's another uh, TED talk of someone talking about uh, how AI ethics is going to impact human ethics. Um, I also have linked here to some major conferences on AI ethics. Uh, the two biggest ones are both run through uh, ACM, uh, which is the uh, Computer Science Professional Society. Um, so uh, Association of Computing Machinery, I think, is, this is just a, anyone who, who's a computer scientist or works in related fields is part of ACM. And they have a yearly uh, uh, conference. It used to be called FATML, and now it's called FACT. But it's the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency uh, Conference. Um, this is a really great conference for thinking about AI ethics, for thinking about some of the technologies uh, that people are, are developing in order to make sure that data sets are fair. Um, it also has a lot of good interaction with legal scholars and uh, lawyers who are trying to develop um, um, uh, policies and regulatory frameworks for managing all this stuff. So uh, this links to uh, the last two years of this conference. I think they record the conference. So you can watch it. Um, it also has all the papers that got accepted to the conference. Uh, it's a very good conference. The, the other conference uh, has less interaction with the legal community, but more interaction, I think, with philosophers and ethicists. This is just in my experience. Um, but uh, this is also through ACM and uh, AAAI, which is the professional AI, uh, a the Artificial Intelligence Professional Society, um, Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, I think it's, it is. But this is AIES. Uh, I presented at AIES in 2018. Um, and then uh, I, I was at the 2020 conference here in New York. Um, and uh, this links to all the papers that were accepted in each of these years. Um, lots of good papers here on fairness, transparency, on uh, regulating uh, AI. Um, this is this is the current intellectual community uh, in AI ethics is at, at these two conferences. Um, I also have a li link to some of the books. Uh, I mentioned the Zuboff book or, earlier. Um, Virginia Eubanks has a great book called Automating Inequality. Um, and uh, Ruha Benjamin has a, a book on the impact of technology on uh, race, um, which he calls the New Jim Code. Um, so uh, uh, all this is uh, good stuff. There's a lot of stuff to learn here, a lot of stuff to talk about. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Um, I will see you all uh, back in class. Let me make a big picture. Hi, I'll see you all back in class. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, bye.